Welcome to Pivot Presents. With me today is James Hankins, founder and consulting strategist at Visor Consulting, creator of the Share of Search analysis tool, and most lately, the Hankins Hexagon. James, thanks for joining me today. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. So we're going to talk about um, the marketing funnel and the uh, models to analyze customers' decision-making process. And I guess the original marketing funnel uh, has been around for quite a long time. So it was first developed back in 1898, a long old time ago now, <laughs> by E. St. Elmo Lewis. And it laid out a very linear process, right? In terms of the stages that a person goes through, attention, interest, desire, and action before making a purchase. And that model, not to confuse it with customer journey mapping, which is more creating a map of all the customer's interactions across touch points with a given brand. But that original AIDA model, it was subject to quite a lot of scrutiny and reevaluation right through the years so far. So can you tell us what inspired you to kind of reassess the traditional funnel and develop your new model, the Hankins Hexacon? I've spent the last 18 years working in kind of media, media agencies as a, a strategy director and kind of there's always the, 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 the chat about the funnel um, and how useful it is um, as a representation of kind of real behavior, real life. Everyone kind of knows it has a real conceptual value the funnel it, it does as a concept it's it's useful um but does it enhance our uh, ability to understand and plan for real life well probably not um would be the question and or oh, the answer should i say and about a year ago i think i wrote a um a paper on my blog uh detailing the the evolution of the kind of the funnel uh, and the various different models it touches on Mc the McKinsey loop it touches on uh, the expansion of the IDA model to in include ever increasing numbers of levels um, and then it came to a, a broad conclusion which was there are some consistent kind of moments and then people work around those moments in a variety of different ways and it this was back in March and it, it, it it posited this the hexagon um a basic basic level and and uh over the summer i think mark ritson did a um a piece in uh, marketing week on and and the google uh kind of paper on the messy middle came out and yes. it got me it got me thinking again about that paper and whether i needed to enhance it because i suppose that the messy middle in my personal opinion, there was a cop out. It's an amazing resource. It's an amazing piece of research. But by saying it's messy, it didn't really add anything because yeah. we all know it's messy. So, yeah. OK, so there's this messy middle. Well, what do we do about it? Well, the other bit was I, I felt it kind of it was still linear because it, it forced you through the messy middle. And sometimes people don't really again it forced, forced behavior. Um, and, and and that's where I felt my my model came in, which was there is no forcing. You kind of, you, you just bounce around. So it's kind of an evolving process to answer your question. I, there was no immediate, oh, I need to, I need to re, re <laughs> change it all. Um, it was just like, right, organic process. This is what I think. Um, theoretically, there is a foundation for it in mathematics. Uh, they're called um, Markov chains, um, which are, um, and I'll get this right because I'm not a statistician, uh, stochastic models, uh, which means certain um, elements are, are fixed. So there's a probability from A to B and that probability is fixed. Yeah. B to C is fixed. And therefore, within, if you were able to put probabilities against the Hankins hexagon, and that's kind of the next stage, um, those are fixed probabilities and you go around and you can you end up with a, okay, well, the likelihood that someone will go through this, this pathway is 80%. Brilliant, mm. right. It's highly likely that they will go through that pathway. So, and it, it, I've had a lot of conversations since I published and a lot of um, uh, more intelligent people than me have said, there's definitely something here. 
Yeah, because maybe we can just to talk about how it does differ from you've mentioned the McKinsey's consumer decision journey. That itself is also getting on a bit in years now. That came out in 2009 originally, which yeah. I was shocked about. But that really, I think that was for me one of the first big new um, decision journey mappings to show people moving outside the kind of traditional marketing funnel. Um, and it also obviously referenced that new phase. Uh, the loyalty phase, which they talked about as a post-purchase phase, which I find interesting. And then the Google piece, you know, as you said, <laughs> I have to agree with you. They did kind of say, you know, you start with a trigger, you end a purchase, and in the middle it gets complicated. And without really explaining, okay, well, what do we do with that? I did like their, their six biases that they talk about that influence the behaviors, kind of that make up that messy middle and how it's quite a complicated web. But to your point, yeah, what do you do with that? Whereas your model and, and the hexagon, you do talk about those six different phases from passive assimilation through trigger, active evaluation, comparison, purchase and post-purchase. And the idea is that they're all interconnected, right? And that actually yeah. a customer might move through those phases in, in any number of given um, ways, yeah. right? Yeah, and you can go forward and backward as well. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's a potential. Um, and because in probability it's and they're multiplicative um so th that has a, a, an impact on the total pro likelihood uh, of going around i mean back to back to that mckinsey loop and i think uh, accenture did one as well very very similar there's the the figure eight yeah. um <clears throat> that that came in and it's it's always bugged me because it's it's a straight line again yeah it might it might feed back on itself um but it's still a straight line you're still going from one moment to the other um and i think also the mckinsey loop missed out that passive assimilation if i'm it, it assumes everything starts at a trigger when actually you know what most time in most categories is spent outside and not being involved in category so what the majority of advertising is about um is not being in category um yeah. So, yeah, there were certain elements, I suppose, and I will point uh, your listeners to to the EQ planner. Um, and, and that's where that paper is, because it goes goes through each of these models and says, well, this part's missing or mm -hmm. this part's why it doesn't quite work. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's science, right? I've put my hypothesis up there and it's there to be disproven um, at this moment in time. Um, but yes, it, it's. It's a bit, as you mentioned earlier, a bit like pinball. You're pinballed yeah. around. Um, and what's really, uh, I was chatting with a, a colleague fairly recently, and we were discussing how there is an element of the funnel in, in, in this, but there's also an element of that kind of pathway. Yeah. Because you can overlay your, um, your channels across this hexagon yeah and and go right well we believe that this channel performs this task this area yeah. and you can you can go right okay well does improve does changing the landing page improve the probability that consumers are going to go through this pathway or yeah. use this 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 node um and you can test it practically um yeah. and, and and enhance it overlaying your actions on top of the the framework I think actually that's one of the things I really liked about, um, so we originally connected after I read your Marketing Week uh, article going through yeah. the, the hexagon. And one of the things I really liked was that you wanted to move away from it being purely theoretical, where, where a lot of the other models are purely theoretical. And, and there you had that pinball, pinball game reference, right, using bumpers, et cetera, to guide um, consumers towards a, a certain stages towards the purchase. Um, but I guess it also brings to the question, and, and we're touching on it already now, what does this mean for how marketing departments are working or, you know, how planners are working in terms of maybe identifying dominant paths and, and helping to influence where is it best to allocate resource and investment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I suppose the, 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 the easy uh, view is that, that some digital planners have already been using that concept of um, kind of, um, uh, I suppose it's decision trees already. The, the, that, that's what this is based on, decision trees. Um, 
but enhancing it by expanding it out to include non-digital channels. Bringing marketing functions together, don't sit with digital over there and kind of uh, non-digital over here. It's 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 marketing. Um, and that, that, and through the line, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it, it seems surprising, but there are a lot of businesses out there that are still structured like that. A lot of agencies mm -hmm. are as well. Yeah. Think about it holistically. Um, and then I wrote in the paper about thinking, thinking in terms of probability, because that's really difficult anyway. Humans struggle with thinking in prob probabilistic terms, if that's the right pronunciation. Um, but that is ultimately what advertising is about. You listen to kind of Byron Sharp and the Ehrenberg Institute, and they talk about kind of, it's just increasing the likelihood that at the point of purchase, someone will choose you. Mm -hmm. that, that's probability. That is, um, that, that is what we're after. Um, and this model aims to provide a framework within which you can do that. And you can kind of, uh, I use the term Bayesian kind of probabilities. And, and, and essentially that's and taking a base point. I think this is the likelihood that something would happen mm -hmm. and testing around it. And so improving that number through kind of testing and learning so that you get more accurate over time, essentially what Bayesian probabilities is, as far as I understand it anyway. And I think this framework allows people to think about their actions in that way. Mm -hmm. That's, it's that practical element, trying to make it easier for people to understand what's actually happening. Yeah. Um, and and prat practical application, it, I'm, I'm, I'm a strategist by kind of trade. And uh, if it's not practical, then it's kind of useless, really, in my mind. Like, is doesn't matter how much good thinking that you've done, unless you turn in it to prat practical application, then it's kind of wasted, really. Um, so to so that's that kind of where, where, where I think it helps anyway, where I think it helps marketers. I fully support that. I think uh, it's great that we would have strategic views, but unless we can apply them and then learn from them, right? Then yeah, yep. no point, where's the value add? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, one other point I, I, I wanted to touch on with you was specifically in relation to customer loyalty. Yep. Because I think the nice thing about, again, your hexagon is you don't talk about loyalty being only at a specific phase of the path to purchase, right? For example, going back to McKinsey, as I referenced, they introduced this kind of loyalty loop um, post-purchase. Yeah. Um, but your model implies that loyalty can be formed throughout the different phases, right? Yeah. Um, you see the application of your model not just for acquisition of new customers, but also to retain existing customers and recognize they're constantly within that hexagon somewhere? Yes, yeah, yeah. So yes, um, again, it, I, I suppose it builds on builds on the work of Ehrenberg um, and, and Sharp around loyalty and how we're, we're loyal to a, a, a basket almost. Um, there is loyalty um, within the market, despite what some people will say. Um, the, the Ehrenberg Institute and Byron Sharp in particular um, does say loyalty exists. <laughs> it doesn't say loyalty doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and so people are going to have a be in that loop and they're going to have enhanced preferences towards certain brands. Um, it's not a standalone state. Um, it improves the probability that you will choose a brand like yep. that. That's ultimately that's what loyalty is right mm -hmm. so considering it as a separate state feels inappropriate it doesn't chime with human behavior human mm -hmm. thought process so yeah absolutely loyalty is a function of kind of improving probability of consumption so it can go up and down absolutely but yeah as a standalone segment as a standalone node it's it just doesn't make sense yeah <laughs> Tell me, do you see brands who are grasping the complexity of this? I mean, we talked about the fact, briefly touched on the fact that there are still a lot of organizations and a lot of agencies who still operate in siloed manners, right? Disjointed digital marketing versus more uh, offline marketing teams. Yeah. Not to mention, obviously, <laughs> disjointment across functions, right? Yeah. Sales, yeah. marketing from a B2B point of view, et cetera. 
Um, but do you, do you see brands grasping this complexity or are we still learning this? And if you do see brands getting it right, who's really nailing it from your point of view? So um, I think the best brands do it unconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, they just do it naturally. And I think that's a function of the quality of the marketeers um, and the marketing culture um, within those businesses. Because um, I jotted, jotted down a couple and actually the ones... <laughs> The ones that get it um, are also the best marketeers. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of one one and the the same. So, I'm, I mentioned McDonald's. Um, McDonald's understand the value of advertising. They understand if you look at how they structure their comms um, around different, whether it's the the directional kind of uh, on the ground outdoor sites versus the kind of the, the, the TV advertising and the way that that tone is completely different. They're in store communications um, and how they kind of utilize kind of retention um, messaging and uh, directional messaging in store. It's all focused on literally bumpering you along to purchase depending on how what mood you're in it makes no preconceived assumption of the next stage mm -hmm. it, so it's it's very well constructed comms planning i suppose um a phrase that's kind of gone out of fashion to a certain degree you wind back 10 years and and, and everyone was talking about comms planning and the power of it and it, it it's kind of um stepped away from um, due to the obsession with data uh, yeah. and how data can do all that. But actually, when you look at a brand like McDonald's or, or Direct Line is another one, a performance, essentially uh, performance, they used to be a DR business. They are a direct business, D2C. But um, the way that they construct their comms, the way that they balance their immediate response comms with, with their, their branding comms, um, how their customer experience when you land on site is structured, is very very impressive. Also, their um, their, their their phone uh, communications when when you pick up the phone to them as well. The way that the the scripts are designed, again, it's it's just really good comms planning and marketing. Mm -hmm. And that's I suppose that's that's the challenge is, and that's arguably what the hexagon's about is to kind of raise the floor. Yeah, it's not a it's not about the brilliant people using it because they do it naturally anyway it's about raising the floor and giving people a framework within which to improve their efforts overall um, be, yeah, yeah. And, and in an integrated way across all the touch points where they're interacting with their customers yeah yeah clear um and maybe one last question for you before we wrap up for today yeah um do you have a favorite example of an organization pivoting to stay relevant and successful maybe related to you know that kind of understanding of customers decision making or maybe not uh yeah well there's 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 a few um the way i talk about pivot is a subtle subtle movements um and the examples i've got here are, are more subtle more subtle i suppose than say a 180 degree flip Mm -hmm. um so jim barksdale's comment around bundling and unbundling so <clears throat> as, a, as a as a business you can you can grow through unbundling um i.e becoming more specialized or bundling doing doing more of your stuff and i think there's an interesting example in the market at the moment around and pivoting around those two terms um there's nike and there's adidas so Nike um, have made a lot of noise around kind of their their shift, their pivot to, to e-commerce. I mean, the majority of their business is still done in store, um, but they are pivoting to a certain degree in that they are um, delisting uh, amongst a lot of uh, digital platforms um, and they're taking that in-house. Um, and they're doing it themselves. They're doing their own fulfillment engines. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are subcontracting some of their last mile distribution, but th they are essentially bundling and doing more and generating greater con control because then they can control the brand experience. Mm -hmm. So they've pivoted from a classic kind of uh, trainer you need to distribute to all these businesses and your products are out there and you can guarantee that somebody's bought them at some point 
and they've seen the emergence of e-commerce and they are they've made a strategic choice to bundle and take more control mm -hmm. um that's in contrast to adidas who again have had very very successful e-commerce um growth but they are unbundling their distribution and looking at a strategic relationship with zalando mm -hmm. so essentially what they're doing is going we're not brilliant at this part of the business we're not brilliant at, at fulfillment and they aren't they really aren't um we're going to pivot and we're going to focus on just making brilliant sportswear and someone else can do that bit mm -hmm. um and we're going getting into bed with zalando big german uh, e-commerce platform they lose a bit of control there they probably lose a bit of margin but they're going we'll make that up by being a stronger sportswear brand and i think that's happened that's live both that that and they're both pivoting slightly from what they previously were yes. the trigger is the same the emergence or the rise of e-commerce but they're two very very different ways of looking at it strategic choices that people are making and i think that's probably the best example out there of businesses that are pivoting to stay relevant but with a very very different uh, kind of outcome um, so those two I like, I like. That, James, because I think what you've shown is there is not only one way to pivot to be successful and remain relevant. There are different yeah. options for how you can pivot. Well, James, I'd like to thank you very much. This has been a really interesting conversation. Um, really enjoy your uh, hexagon, Hankins hexagon, and that <laughs> new um, that new model for uh, customer decision making. And I hope we see it applied across the board in organisations going forward. Because I, for one, am a big believer in it. Um, thank you for joining today. Thank you very much. This has been Pivot Presents. I'm Ruth Coates. Don't forget to link with me on LinkedIn and check out pivotms.com. Mm -hmm.